Officer Wysocki, you understand this is a criminal trial? That is correct. And the seriousness of the charges? Yes. And so if there's anything, any facts you don't know or don't remember, you won't guess? That is correct. And you won't, and in your testimony you won't exaggerate? That is correct. And you would agree that for an officer to exaggerate when they're testifying that under oath would be the same as lying? Yes, that's correct. And as you've done throughout this hearing, or this trial so far, when you didn't remember something, you would, if your report would refresh your memory, you'd ask for your report, right? That is correct. And you know to do that as a trained officer? Yes, sir. And throughout the prior hearings that we've had in this case, you've had access to your report, correct? That is correct. And I want to talk to you about your prior, prior experience before becoming a police officer. Okay, you, you did attend a police academy. Yes, that's correct. And you received training there? Yes. And some of the training you received is a report writing? Yes, sir. And investigate an investigation? Yes, sir. And as far as report writing goes, you're trained to make sure your reports are accurate? Yes, sir. Complete? Yes, sir. And objective? Yes, sir. And when I say objective, I mean you're the only one out there writing a report, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and so you'll, you're trained to include facts that both support your opinion and facts that may show that you could be wrong. Together, all the facts, correct? All the facts, sir. Another subject you took was on presenting testimony. Yes, sir. You took actually took classes at the academy on how to present testimony in courtroom. Uh, they were brief, but they had gone over testimony. Okay, and then one of the things they teach you is how to present testimony in a credible fashion. Is that true? I don't recall. Now, prior to testifying here today, you did do some preparation, correct? I reviewed my report today. You reviewed your report. Did you discuss this matter with the prosecutor prior to testifying today? Yes, we did. Did you read the transcript of a hearing which took place on October 3rd, 2006? Not today, but I had a back at last time. And you read that transcript? Yes. And the transcript of the last hearing that took place where you presented testimony in this case was dated... Uh, November 14, 2006. Have you had an opportunity to review that testimony? I did not review that testimony. Okay. The, the question was, have you had an opportunity? To, did you have the opportunity to review it? I did it? not have the opportunity to review that testimony. Okay. The prosecutor never asked you if you wanted to review your prior testimony? Not from the November 14. Have you discussed this case with Officer Freeman? Yes. Now, when it... Another thing that you learned at the Academy was what evidence is. That is correct. And how to identify it. Yes. And collect it. Yes, sir. And preserve it. Yes, sir. And to be careful that it doesn't get contaminated. Correct? Yes, sir. Examples of evidence in this case would be, well, we haven't seen it yet, but I assume a breath test ticket. Yes, sir. The video, which we saw. Yes, sir. And that's what... That's the evidence that you gather is what you assist the prosecutor with when presenting the state's case. That is correct, sir. Because you know that it's your it's your side's burden of proof, right? That is correct. You don't, you know, I guess you wrote the ticket that charged the case, right? In I this wrote case. the report that I wrote the report. Okay. And when you're writing this report, you know that any case may go to trial. That is correct. And that's why you're thorough in your investigation? Putting in all the information, sir. And this report was written after arresting Ken Edwards? That is correct. It was written after you'd had his vehicle towed, correct? That is correct. It was written after Officer Freeman administered a data master test to him? That is correct.
And so you wrote this report in a manner that would tend to justify your actions in your arrest. Yes. Now, in writing your report, you would agree that officer, I mean, information or evidence that points towards Ken Edwards' innocence would be significant and important information. All the information would be in there. Okay, but specifically, evidence that points towards his innocence would be important information, correct? Could you explain? Well, was there any evidence that you saw out there on the road that pointed towards Ken Edwards' innocence? I don't recall. Okay. And if you didn't write it in your report, then you don't have a memory of it, correct? That is correct. For example, when you activate your overhead lights, when you decide you're going to stop Ken, he pulls over his car immediately, correct? He pulls the vehicle over, yes. And that, in, in your experience, in your training, you're trained that if a person drives on for you know, a length of time for you know, another quarter mile, half mile, that's a sign. That could be a sign of intoxication, right? It could be a sign of intoxication, and it can be a sign of other things also. Okay, but you're trained that to look for that as a sign of potential intoxication. Uh, yes, I, I could see, see that, yes. All right, so the ability, first, when a person reacts in a normal fashion to your overhead lights, they at least be one sign that their mental and physical abilities are normal. You could say that, yes. Okay. And another example would be when you ask him to get out of the vehicle. He has no difficulty doing that, does he? I don't recall. Okay. Well, if he stumbled or had to hold the door for support, those are things you're trained to look for. That is correct. I and had you seen those things, you would have noted it in your report. Yes, sir. And does it note anywhere in your report that he had difficulty doing that? No, sir. There's no information of that in my report. And there's nothing in your report that says he was able to get out of the car in a normal fashion either, is there, sir? No, I didn't believe it was relevant. Okay, but a person, if a person's able to do that without any difficulty, that's at least one sign correct. that their mental and physical abilities are normal, correct? To an extent, yes. And another thing would be you ask him for his license, registration, and proof of insurance. And he knows exactly where those things are, correct? Uh, he had told me where they where they were. Okay. He wasn't fumbling. I, was it at the time it, I spoke to him at the front? I don't recall. But he wasn't fumbling, looking in the glove compartment for these things when they weren't there, was he? No. He had, uh, he had when I made the stop, his door came open. Um, and uh, he was spoken. I was talking with him with the door open, so... And again, if a person can't, doesn't know where their license, registration, and proof of insurance is, again, you're trained to look for that as another sign of intoxication. Yes, sir. You can say that. Okay, or if he had fumbled through his wallet and not seen his license and passed over it, again, you would have said another sign of intoxication. If there are other contributing factors, yes. Okay, if he had gone through his wallet, getting his license, and passed by it, you would consider that to be a sign of intoxication. Correct? Not necessarily, but it could lead that way. Okay, and he didn't have any difficulty telling you where his information was, and when you hand him his wallet, he went through it and got his license with no difficulty, correct? I, I don't recall. I, I, you saw that uh, he had got, given me his license and opened his wallet. Was there, there was difficulty. I don't, I don't recall. Was there anything in your report that indicated he had trouble doing that? No, not at all. And when you ask him to step out and walk back towards your car, I mean, so he's on near the back of his car, he didn't have to hold the car for support. He had any trouble doing that, did he? No. Okay, so when you ask him to walk in a normal fashion, he had no difficulty walking in a normal fashion. He wasn't swaying or anything like that. He was walking in a normal fashion. I, I don't recall. Okay, is there anywhere in your report, because it wasn't just him walking back to the car, but you also took him to the police station. You had to walk into the police station. That is Do correct. a lot of walking. Is there anywhere in your report where you document that he had trouble walking when you asked him to walk in a normal fashion. I did not put that in my report. Okay, and had you made those observations, whether it be on the side of the road or at the police station, you would have put it in your report. Um, possibly. 
possibly, if, if he's stumbling around, you're not going to put that in your report as a sign of intoxication? Around, but if he's not stumbling around, sir, then I wouldn't put it okay, in the so report. Okay, so... He's walking normal. You're not going to write in your report. He's walking normal. Appears that to be normal. That is correct. I wouldn't put that he would be walking normally, sir. But you know that alcohol can affect a person's ability to walk, right? It can affect their physical and mental state, yes. All right. So from everything you could observe, when you asked him to walk in a normal fashion, he had no difficulty walking. That is correct. Now, as far as your in-car camera goes... It's there for a reason, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's there to protect police officers from false accusations. Yes, sir. And so that way, if an accusation is leveled against you, they've done something improper, you can simply say, pull the tape. It's, it goes both ways. Because the tape is an objective record of what took place out there, correct? That's correct. And it's also there to protect citizens. Yes. From false accusations from police officers. And it also, it also saves us the exact same way. Exactly. It's for both of your safety, both yes. of your protection. Yes. And there is no audio on this video, correct? That is correct, sir. But prior to going out that day, it's your responsibility to test your audio to make sure it's working. It, we turn it on and make sure that it is working. And if it's not working, to document to your superiors that it's not working. Yes, there's, there's, there's uh, reports and forms that need to be compiled. And you're required to use that on all stops. That is correct. Is that just like the visual provides an objective record of what actually was seen out there, the audio provides an objective record of what was said out there, correct? Yes, sir. And you said it's supposed to go on when you turn your lights on, is that right? Yes, sir. But you actually have to turn your microphone on, on your belt, for it to actually go on. That's not how it works. Is your microphone... There's there's a thing on your belt, right? Yes. For your microphone. You have, we have a microphone, yes. And there's a. it's run by battery? Yes, a rechargeable it's, battery. It's not on all the time, is it? No. You have to manually turn it on. When the lights are activated, sir, the the camera and the microphone automatically turn Maybe I'm not being clear. At the beginning of your shift, you have to manually turn it on, correct? Oh, yes. Okay, so if you... So they, you have to sync it into the system, and then you have to do a check to see if... When you press in your mic, well... The, will it activate the audio? And so, had you not done that, that would be at least one explanation why there's no audio on this tape, correct? Correct. correct. Now, I want to talk to you about the advantages of not having audio. Okay. One advantage for you is be there would be no objective record of what was said. People would just have to take your word for it, correct? Yes, sir. Another advantage would be on how can... Another advantage for you would be that the only record would be, you know, at least from the state's point of how I performed on the ABCs, would be how you say, correct? Yes, sir. So basically, the advantage is that the jury would just simply have to rely on your word, correct? Yes, sir. Now, when you first see Ken at the intersection of Lasser and Ten Mile, he's on Ten Mile and he's heading in a westerly direction, right? Yes, sir. And he has his door open. Yes, sir. And he has his head out his door. Yes, sir. When you pull him over, you never ask him why he has his head out the door, correct? I don't recall. Well, it seemed like a logical question, wouldn't it? It would seem like one. I don't recall. Is there anything in your report that would indicate that you ask him that question? That nowhere in my report does it say I mentioned that question. And he doesn't smell of vomit, correct? I don't recall. You're saying he may have smelled of vomit, but you just have no memory of it? I don't have the recollection of any vomit being smelled. Okay, had you smelled vomit, you would have noted that in your report, correct? Yes. All right, so by the fact that it's not noted, we can assume that you didn't smell any vomit, correct? There's an assumption, yes. Did you ever consider the reason why he may have had, may have his head out the door at that intersection because he was spitting out blood? Uh, he could have been having his head out there for any type, anything. And uh, seeing that, 
I didn't know it was suspicious to me, and so that's why I thought I would investigate further. Well, the driving that you observed, today you didn't use the word swerving when describing Ken Edwards' driving. Is that your memory of your testimony? That is correct. Okay. Now, did you, during your conversations with the prosecutor before testifying, did you guys talk about whether to use the word swerving or not? Uh, no. Because in your report, you sure put the word swerving. Yes, I do see that. It put the word swerving. Right. And then in your prior testimony in October uh, 3rd, 2006, on page 7, you also testified, I mean, you testified that you observed swerving going from one side of the lane to the next as he went down the street. Do you remember that? What line are you referring to, counsel? Line 10. Do you remember that, officer? Could you repeat it, please, sir? The question is, do you remember testifying that you also, at the October 3rd, 2006 hearing, that you also observed, Gant referring to Ken's car, swerving, going from one side of the lane to the next, one side of the lane to the next as it went down the street. I don't recall, but, uh, sir, if it is in there, then that's what I said. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. In writing, sir. Yes, sir. And did you also testify at the hearing in November 14th that you observed Ken Edwards' car swerving within his lane? I don't recall. I had, it's in writing then. Yes, I did. Now, would you agree that using the word swerving to, the, to describe the driving would be a little bit of an exaggeration? Well, swerving can be taken in different contexts, sir. But fortunately, we have the video, right? So we know yes, exactly how he was that driving. Is correct, sir. Now, As far as when you approach this vehicle, do you remember testifying You remember testifying that when you approached his vehicle that he put his wind put his window down. I I don't recall, and if I did, it possibly was a mistake. Okay, so you because we know that he didn't put his window down, right? That is correct. He opened his door. So, but that's what people usually do when you approach their vehicle. That is correct. And so, is it possible that you sometimes mistake one? case for another, mix up the facts from one case to another? Well, we make a lot of stops and we deal with a lot of people. So, so yeah. are you saying it is possible that sometimes you mix up facts from different cases? Yes. Now, when you pulled Ken Edwards over at about, what, 3.30, 3.40 in the morning, is that right? Give or take, yes. And, well, actually, one of the things you asked him to do is you ask him what time it is, right? That is correct. And he tells you it's 3.40 in the morning. May I review my report? Sure, if that would help you refresh your memory. Yeah. It says right here that uh, I wrote 3.40 a.m. in the morning is what he replied to me. Okay, and the time was actually, what, 3.45? Uh, shortly thereafter. I, okay. I don't recall. But that's one of the things you do to test people to see about their mental cognizance, right? 
where they're at, what time it is, okay. if they know their surroundings. And by demonstrating that he knows what time it is, he was demonstrating that he knows his surroundings, right? That is correct. So that at least be one more sign that whatever alcohol he drank that night didn't affect his mental abilities. That is correct. Now, pulling him over at, let's say, 3.30 in the morning, it's your experience that people that you pull over are often nervous. Some people are nervous. Some people um, aren't. It depends on the person, sir. There's people you pull over that aren't nervous at all? There are some people that have had contact with the police quite a bit and, and don't get nervous, yet others who never get pulled over, sir, can be, can be nervous. When you eventually ask Ken to, to stand up and step from his car, you ask him, you do this for the purposes of having him do these field sobriety tests, is that right? To have him exit the vehicle, sir? Yeah. That's correct. Because you want to test out, well, you want to see if he can do these tests that you asked him to do. That is correct. And you're trying to build up for your probable cause to, to make an arrest. That is correct, sir. You would agree that everybody has different coordination levels. Everybody has, every person is different, correct. And everybody responds to stress differently, right? I'm not an expert, but yes. And it would be important to know what a person's physical limitations were prior to asking him to perform these tests, would it not? Yes. For example, if a person has a painful back or a painful knee or ankle, that can affect their ability to perform your tasks. Yes, it can. And one of the things that you observed on Ken was lacerations. Do you, do you have that photograph? Mm -hmm. Sheriff's deputy photograph. Sir, Ken Edwards had lacerations on his face, correct? Mary, Cuts. My report, sir. Well, do you have any independent memory other than your report of injuries to his face? Yeah, I don't recall. All right. So that would be a would that be a no? I I can't remember, sir. Well, Can I would you my report? Sure. Thank you, sir. Okay, it says that... Uh, if you could, officer, officer, I think it's inappropriate. I believe it's not proper to read your report. If, things, if it refreshes right. your memory, right. to refresh your memory and then to testify, but not to read your report into the record. Yes, sir. All right, so does it refresh your memory? Yeah, he had some cuts on his forehead. Uh, it's a... Uh, Looks like a booking sheet and arrest summary. Okay, does it depict injuries in the residential area? Um, yes, there are some injuries to the subject's uh, facial area. And is that what he looked like on the night you arrested? That is correct. Thank you, officer. Now, Jan was easily seen on this photograph. You both? Let me get to it. You've also testified, you've also previously testified, um, in, remember, in this case, that you believe Ken Edwards had injuries near his mouth area. Do you recall that? When was this, sir? Um, on November 14th. I don't recall, but once again, if it was written, then that's what I stated. Well... If I showed you the transcript, would you please? Am I supposed to witness your honor? Yes. Thanks. On line 15, the prosecutor asked about the cuts or abrasion as you described it. Can you recall where they were located? Okay, what line, sir? I just read the question on line 15. Okay. Was that your answer? That was my answer. It was written, sir. Okay, and your answer is I don't recall. I think they were near the mouth area, but I don't recall. Correct? Yes, sir. That's what I have. And then that's what it says. 
I asked you on cross-examination, and you testified on direct that they were around the mouth area, and your answer was, at line 25, it's on page 40, Mr. Turn. The answer was, I do believe, correct? Yeah, I, that's what it says, sir, the yes, that's well, that was your sworn what testimony, wasn't it? My sworn testimony was, sir. And you also testified that his clothes were, what, disheveled, untucked? Is that right? I had stated today that they were disorderly. Okay. Do you recall specifically how they were? Now, we saw the video from the time that you stopped him to the time you actually had him start performing some type of uh, dexterity test. You remember that? There was a time before. From the time he got out to the time that the sobriety tests were administered. Okay, and I think according to the video, that was nine to ten minutes. Would you agree with that? If that's what, it, if that's the time, then yes, I would agree to it. And during these nine to ten minutes, Ken Edwards is describing to you and telling you about how he was attacked down in Detroit. Correct. Action calls for hearsay as to what Mr. Edwards told him. Your response. Um, my response, Your Honor is that he's talked about other things with conversations he's having with Mr. Edwards, and therefore, well, first of all, your rule of completeness, the entire conversation comes in, because he's there. He's what other conversation about Mr. Edwards? Did we he asked him you know, where he yes. was, what he had to drink. This is all in the same area. But again, it's not to the truth that the matter asserted. It's a matter of, you know, this, did he make the statement to him? Did he ask him? Was he telling him about what had happened to him? If it's not for the truth, then what purpose is it? It, does, it certainly doesn't demonstrate how it affected Officer Wysocki in asking whether or not he'd been drinking. But Counsel's it, inquiry as to whether or not it, Mr. Edwards indicated anything about being robbed or assaulted. Those are completely separate. The rule of completeness would not necessitate... Excuse me. Necessitate? Not, thank you. Would not necessitate the inclusion of Mr. Edwards' other statements. Moreover, Your Honor, only admissions against the declarant's interest would be admissible and it has to be offered by the party opponent. Mr. Edwards is neither under MRE 801 D1. Then I would follow your honor. If the court does rule hearsay that would come in under an excited utterance exception or a statement of then existing state of mind. All right. Well, I do think it's hearsay. Now, what ex why do you believe it's an excited utterance? He just been jumped and robbed 15 minutes, 20 minutes earlier, your honor. You want to respond this time? Your Honor, exactly. This had occurred allegedly. We have we have no foundation yet to indicate that any of this occurred at all, let alone 15 to 20 minutes prior. There's been absolutely no foundation, nothing laid to indicate that the defendant was in an excited state or any of that to, to satisfy the excited utterance exception. Moreover, present sense impressions, a statement made at the time the individual is perceiving the event. Well, I agree. Clearly, I don't, I don't think not. it's a present sense impression whatsoever. Thank you. As far as excited utterance is concerned, it, it might be, but I don't see a foundation, as is argued by the people, for that statement to come in as such. Okay. Let and me, I don't know if you can get from this witness, unfortunately. But go ahead. Can I, you can lay a foundation and help yourself. Officer, you observed injuries to his, his head, correct? His head and there face. Some injuries to his head. Okay. Did you inquire? And they were fresh injuries. I, I don't recall whether they're fresh. Did you inquire to him and how he got? Did you ask him how he got those injuries? I don't recall. Did he ask you to? Did he? Did he ask you to make a report to Detroit? I'm going to object at this point as to what the as to what the defendant asked of the officer. This would be hearsay. It's a continuing objection. Well, Your Honor, that would not be hearsay because hearsay is a statement or assertion. And a question is not an assertion. It's a question. It's not a statement. So anything that somebody asks does not fall within the hearsay. All right. Well, how do you respond to that, Mr. Earl? Your Honor, the people believe that the defendant's statement is indeed an assertion. Your Honor, would you please call the police for me? And Detroit would be an assertion, asserting that this officer do something for him. I think that is an assertion. It also presupposes a fact which isn't in evidence. I don't believe that this is an appropriate question, Your Honor. 
Well, I think it may have presupposed the fact that he hasn't yet been established to be an evidence. The question is, is it an out-of-state court statement used to prove the truth of the matter? It is an assertion as to whether or not he stated, will you call the police for me? And it is made out of court. And I'm assuming that it's used to show that he did, in fact, ask the officer to call the police for him. So I agree that it's hearsay. Thank you. Officer, do you recall what your conversation was about for the 10 minutes prior to you having, from the time you stopped him to the time you had him get out of the car? I mean, get out of the car and then start performing these field tests. Do you recall what your conversation was about? I don't recall. Okay. So you're talking to him the whole time, right? Yes. We're having a conversation, but what it was about, I can't remember. 